Hey guys, this is John and Austin, and this is another episode of the Meat Logistics Podcast presented by Waltons. Patrick, surprise, recorded us earlier. Don't know how much of that's going to get oh, used. Oh man, what if it? Yeah, I don't think much of it, it was uh, topical. It was. It was. Yeah, totally non-meat related. Yeah, that's fine. You that can't way. even say locker room talk anymore because it sounds way more extreme than it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really wasn't that bad. We were talking about aliens. Stuff. If anyway. Um, okay, so we've got a, a couple of things. Uh, first thing I want to get into is that Austin was supposed to put the wig on first thing this morning so that he could wear it all day Wednesday. He didn't. So another week is going by without Austin fulfilling any of his wig oh my God. obligations. Dude, you took three months, not so three months, but it, you took two months to get it. Next Wednesday, so. I will meet you at the door as you come in. And we You'll will forget. Put, oh, 100%. <laughs> we will put the wig on and then start taking pictures. With my awesome new camera from my Galaxy S24S that you got me. So thank you for that. I love that phone. It's even better than the 23. Like oh, it's well, yeah. Every so year, much faster. The, the tech gets better. Camera's incredible. Um, the only thing I don't like on it, uh, this is meat processing, right? What we were talking about before was not, but this is. Uh, the only thing I don't like, it doesn't do as good a job, I don't think, with uh, voice to text stuff, which oh, is pretty much true. all I use. I actually use that today uh, for something. And uh, Google's voice recorder is hands down best in the industry. Yeah, I switched to that. I finally found a way to use Oh, can Google. you get that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yep, sweet. I'm going to have to switch back so over. There. I just switched to that. Um, all right. So uh, one of the things that's going on a lot with Meatistics is a long and drawn out conversation on encapsulated citric acid. Austin and I both put our two cents in uh, with information that we've acquired over years of doing this stuff, plus talking to some people within the building, who also talked to some people without the building. Um, but the conversation just continues to go on. Um, and it seems like people don't understand that encapsulated citric acid is, in fact, a cure accelerator. Uh, you can take the word of two random guys, if, if you not us, two other random guys, if you want. Um, but it is a cure accelerator. To reinforce that, we brought in Ryan Gozer uh, from Balchem, or Balchem. They are the ones who actually are uh, the manufacturers of this product. Um, they control all of their ingredients. Uh, they do a ton of encapsulation, a um, bunch of different kind of weird things we touched on a little bit. But I asked him to come in. Come on, John. Uh, that's the first time ever. <laughs> you do it every time. This um, is true. I'm, asked, I'm on, uh, to be clear, I started the, the podcast on Do Not Disturb. Very good. So. Um, he came in for a 17-minute conversation. Uh, we talked about encapsulated, encapsulated citric acid, how it is a cure accelerator. Um, I'm, I'll be upfront. It is not the easiest thing to follow. Uh, did you get a chance to watch it? Yeah. Okay. It's not the easiest thing to follow, but he does explain it. Um, and then we finished off just talking about nitrates a little bit. Um, and then I wanted his opinion on uh, you know the celery juice powder natural way to go and he didn't disappoint in either one of them uh so we're gonna we're gonna cut over to that right now all right so a lot of guys have been following along on the post on Meatistics about is encapsulated citric acid a cure accelerator or not there are a lot of different varying opinions on this this is ryan from Balchem. Uh, that is who we get our encapsulated citric acid from these are the producers of that encapsulated citric acid so we brought him in to have a conversation about it and get some definitive answers on it. Ryan, thank you for coming. Really, really appreciate this. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Thank you for introducing me. Thank you. Of course. All right. Let's talk a little bit about how encapsulated citric acid is working in the meat and what you think of it as a cure accelerator or not a cure accelerator. Yeah. I'll explain uh, basically what an NCAP is um, and then how it's used uh, pretty widely in the meat industry and then um, specifically how it pertains to uh, being a cure accelerator. Right. So um, starting out, an encapsulated acid is a dried substrate encapsulated, fully coated in a uh, vegetable oil, fully hydrogenated vegetable oil, or we do have a non-hydro option as well. And what that really does is it protects one of two things. It either protects the substrate, which in this case would be encapsulated or which would be citric acid, as well as it protects that citric acid from the meat right? each way. So really what, what it does in, in the meat processing is it, it allows you to um, be an alternative to fermentation to still get that low pH for that shelf stability mm -hmm. that under 5 pH. And just the tang. 
Yes. I mean, yep, 100%. For, uh, a lot of places in the US, if it doesn't have a tang, it's not summer sausage. I add it to every cured sausage product I make because I, A, I like the tang. B, I like knowing that I have that little extra, you know, I'm a little bit safer on shelf stability or just in general life cycle of the product. Um, so, yes, definitely from a pH standpoint, but also, in my opinion, at least, it's a taste additive as well. Absolutely. So, um, no, and and especially from a, a, science dif- a scientific standpoint, a, um, a dry stick versus a semi-dried stick, mm-hmm. in my opinion, I'd rather have a, a nice moist piece of uh, uh, sausage than a, a, a dried one that sure. I need a drink of water afterwards for. <laughs> um, so really, again, it, it's, it's protecting that, that meat from the citric acid at the time of cooking. Um, so really the, the encapsulated citric acids melt between 135 and 165. Mm-hmm. So that meat is protected until those temperatures where that encapsulation will then be melted off and the and the acid will start interacting with the meat proteins. Right. Which is where you really start getting a very rapid drop in pH, which is makes it a little bit different than fermentation, which is a very long, gradual process. This is a very specific and very time accelerated reaction that is happening where the pH is dropping rapidly. Listen, there was a time I went to a, a Iowa State for a short course on yeah. semi-dried sausages. And this question has come up before on Meatristics. The professor who's doing the, the meat science final presentation didn't address it. I literally chased him down. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm like, I, you have to answer this question for him. Like, how? Make it make sense. And even he was like, hey, listen, this isn't a fully understood process. Said one way you can look at it is uh, we're making an acidic environment. So a lot of these, uh, you know, single cell bacteria is whatever we're worried about can't take in any food and it helps kill them off. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But it doesn't really address how the cure is like accelerated through it. So it sounds like what you're starting to say is that it is a pH drop that is then what, like kickstarting the nitric oxide mix? Yep. So, okay. so, so during the, the curing process, you have NO2 and even before that, NO3 going right. to, to NO2. <laughs> so much. Going to, um, and then that, that nitric oxide will then interact with the uh, heme myoglobin <laughs> to, to create a nitrosa, nitroso hemochrome. Right. A very, a very specific uh-huh. chemical reaction. Um, and what is interesting about that is that it can be that curing reaction going from NO2 to NO and back to NO2. That happens through the whole shelf life of the product. Okay. There is a constant curing reaction taking place, which is why um, you have a lot of residual nitrite in the product, right? So that way throughout the curing process, it still is... Um, able to protect against colostrum botulinum Uh through the shelf life of that product, going from NO2 to NO back to NO2. And so one way to accelerate that reaction from NO2 to NO Mm -hmm. is by adding in a hydrogen ion. And so then you are knocking off a oxygen, an oxygen molecule off of that. Okay. And so it's in, in a high P or in a low pH environment the curing reaction will happen faster. Okay. Do you have any like uh, from uh, how from, quickly? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so I was I did some research before this sure. podcast. Um, from five point four to six. Okay. Is where that the the pH range for a accelerated curing reaction to take place. Okay. So what and to that because that is a specific pH range and because uh, I have been. Um, graciously welcomed into the world of pH through uh, <laughs> encapsulated acid. That is a very sp- specific pH range that that takes place. Um, I would say a lot of processors don't know what their starting pH is. Right. To to then be able to tell you what where your where that meat batter pH is before that curing reaction during that curing reaction to get that specific pH range to actually accelerate that curing process at the beginning when you're, when you're cooking it. Okay. Um, so you said 5.4 to six, that's the range where it is an accelerant. Yes. Yep. Yep. That, that is the range where the curing reaction is accelerated. Okay. Okay. Um, 
what happens if it gets to like 5.2? Um, it is not, it is not then as effective as an accelerator okay. at that pH range. Okay. Um, so what we're doing, we're adding it to the product. It's encapsulated to both protect it from the meat and the meat from it. Um, and I, I do have a question on that after. Yep. Um, then we're, we're melting it throughout the cook, throughout the higher ends of the cooking cycle, right? Once you yep. get to 130 ish, yep. it starts to melt. Um, it is introduced to the meat, which is then certainly if it's pork or if it's beef, we're already in that 5.4 to 6 range. Yeah. Yep. Right? Exactly. Like we're yep, already yep, there. Yep, that's, yep. The, that's the, the pH of the meat. Exactly. And as soon as we start adding any type of uh, sigillant to it, that's going to certainly put it in that range. And, and, and one thing I, I, do want to call out to that the meat batter ph will be different than the raw meat ph oh of course yep of yep, course yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah absolutely yes. Yes. um we have a um a ph meter i mean if you stick it just in a hunk of meat it's going to be very different than after we've uh we've ground it we've mixed it with seasoning and salt like all of that these are all chemical reactions that are going on in there though you can't see them they are occurring i mean a great way to do it uh, or to to visualize this for me at least is grind some meat, uh, put just a bratwurst seasoning in, in it, put it in the fridge. Grind some meat, put a snack stick seasoning with some cure in it, put it in the fridge, mix them all up, go back, check what they look like in 30 minutes. They're not going to look anything alike. Like Correct. There are color changes that are going on in there. Um, and honestly, you did a great job with all the nitriso meta. Because <laughs> the one that always gets me is... Um, Met myoglobin. Like, why do we need that term? Like, come on. It's just it, it, we don't need five different words for the red coloring in meat, right? It's, it's right. not blood, and it does change throughout the cycle. But um, for laymen, sometimes that gets a little a little confusing. Okay, so really, what it is is when we're in between five point four and six, we have a cure added to it, a, a sodium nitrite cure, and then we're introducing uh, a uh, encapsulated citric acid. We're kickstarting that conversion. Yep. And then we're also, since we're going to make sure that we're staying in that pH range, we're giving it a longer life where it can continue to keep the meat safe. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes. And and really that, that curing reaction, that protection, the, the need for the curing accelerator is really important during the, the initial cooking process. Right. Yep. For sure. Just to, to make sure that we get enough of it going. Yes. Right. Yep, yep. 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 So if you're not adding a cure accelerator, we always tell you, leave it in the fridge overnight. After you stuff it, please don't mix and hold it as a batter and then try and stuff. You're going to hurt your stuffer. Um, but if you want to go right to the smoker, uh, encapsulated citric acid is a great way to do it to make sure that your product's safe um, and uh, to give you a little bit extra curing power over time. Um, I forget what I wanted to go back to. What we were talking about exactly when I said that. Um, nope, I forgot. The, the other thing I wanted to, to 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 talk about is that you know there, there's other curing accelerators okay. as well. You know, sure. uh, uh, sodium erythorbate, sodium one. ascorbate. Yep. Um, you know, clean label options as well. Um, that 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 process is a lot more of a direct um, chemical reaction that is taking place um, versus a chemical reaction in a low pH environment. Okay. Yep, that that makes total sense. We use sodium erythorbate here uh, from time to time when we really want to focus on color development. Yep, um, I'm sure. Do you guys sell like cherry powder? Was that one of the? Uh, yep, natural yep, ones yep, yep, yep. About? Familiar with that? Yep. Just that this isn't what we're here to discuss. So feel free to tell me that you don't want to talk about it. Uh -huh. um, what do you think about the use of like celery juice powder as a uh, no nitrite added type of of cure? Do you have thoughts on? Yeah, that? yeah. No. Um, so. You know, I know that there was a petition sent out, what would have been maybe in 2018 timeframe, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking for the USDA to to really look at that labeling, which um, from a consumer standpoint, I completely agree with that. Um, there are 100% nitrates or nitrates present in that meat, um, even though it is coming from a natural source like celery right. um, versus a, a, a true sodium nitrite. Um, source, which, um, you know, sodium nitrate is, uh, is not a naturally found product as well. Um, sodium nitrate is, right. um, and so there's a chemical process that is taking place to, to convert it from NO3, NO3 to NO2, even in a, a cultured celery space like that. Right. Um, and so, you know, 
from a consumer standpoint or, or myself as a consumer, I totally think that, uh, that, that, that labeling needs to be revised as well as from a, an, an industry standpoint. Um, I think that's terribly misleading to, to customers. I agree. Um, you know, especially with, uh, you know, if someone has health concerns about their levels of nitrites and, and their intake on that, having a very clear, you know, even if it's, uh, you know, naturally cured or, you know, naturally done. Absolutely. You know, be fine uh, with that. A hundred percent. Yep. But the, but the actual, the actual labeling of that, um, and then, you know, to have to find an asterisk and then go to find that asterisk that says, except those Nobody's naturally looking can- at that. Yep. No. And, and, you know, from, from an industry standpoint, I would say I get that, or, you know, actually from a personal standpoint, I get that often that, that question about celery or, you know, different questions in the meat industry and, uh, you know, to, to necessarily not agree with those, uh, it can be tough at times, I'm sure. you know, and, and, and to really, from a, a consumer standpoint, it, it, it's hard to be a consumer. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ingredients out there that's put in a lot of different products that, um, you know, if you're not a conscious consumer, you're, you're, you're going to miss the, miss, miss what you're looking for, or, or, um, you know, even have a, a false sense of, uh, you know, knowledge in that, uh, in that ingredient or, or in that product that you're eating. Sure. I'm eating uh, no nitrite bacon. You're not. <laughs> I mean, you're not. It's the same exact thing. If it, if it was real no nitrite bacon, it would be pork belly. Exactly. You know. <laughs> What's happened is you've been marketed to very well. Um, now, are there people who have a preference for that nitrate, and a natural nitrate, if that's what we want to call it? Um, 100%. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But it is chemically... It's the same thing. It's just from a different source. That's it. Other than that, they're the same thing. Um, And trying to like beat that into people's heads is difficult. Um, And then also, uh, you know, here at Walton's, we're 75% commercial, 25% retail. Um, There are commercial customers who like making it specifically because, hey, I can charge more for this because it's a, uh, you know, a natural product. And I get that. Yep. I get that. Um, it doesn't have as wide a range, right? It's a little bit niche, not so much niche anymore, but it's a smaller market. So the mm-hmm. ingredients are more expensive. You have to charge a little bit more for it. Um, but it is, uh, I, I can't help but look at it and be like, yeah, that's just misleading. Oh, and, and you know, uh, and I, I think for it to be better, better marketed or better, um, better communicated to the consumer of sure. what's actually going on. Because at the end of the day, you know, a, a wrong post here or, or a wrong, um, wrong publicity on it. And, um, then, you know, you, you, you miss out on a education standpoint or, you know, sales on that item. Um, when, you know, it, it really is that, that same chemical process that's taking place. Um, and, you know, whether, you know, your opinion on, on whether you use nitrates or not, you know, that there is a, um, uh, a microbial impact of using nitrites, yep. um, you know, definitely, uh, as well as, you know, nice pink color and, and things like that, um, that, you know, I definitely want to make sure that, um, someone is using enough nitrite as well, um, you know, to, to keep it protected against colostrum botulinum throughout the shelf life of the product. Yeah. Cause that's not one you want to mess around with. It's really not. Nope. nope there's not there's one a I do. few ones in the, the industry that we were concerned with. Uh, I heard it explained to me once um, at one of these short courses I was at. Uh, they said, you could get a couple thousand cells of salmonella in your body. And you may get a little bit sick. Like if you're weak, you'll probably go to the hospital. You might go to the hospital. I mean, weekend, like if you have a weakened immune system or something. It's like if you get a dozen cells of botulism in you like good luck you are in for it so there's there's different levels to what we're concerned with and botulism is definitely at the top of that or near the top of that list and 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 really what what um how it controls that microbe is just having a high nitrogen environment Mm -hmm. that spore cannot open up in a high nitrogen environment and so that's what the the curing process really is um you know one of the main reasons that uh, it's widely used in commercial uh, commercial spaces and, and um, even at home is is to control for multiple pathogens, but uh, to really have a high nitrogen environment for CBOT not to grow. Yep. Anything else you want to discuss? Um, cultured celery. Mm, 
Well, that I can really think of. Awesome. Um, we really appreciate you coming in absolutely. today. Hopefully that helped answer some, some of people's questions. If you have more questions, uh, just post them in the Meatgistics blog or page uh, of this podcast. We'll get them to Ryan and see if we can't get a little bit more answers on anything specific you guys had. But that's awesome. Really appreciate you coming in. Thanks, John. Thanks, Bob. Uh, so hopefully that cleared up some uh, uh, confusion um, and gave a authoritative answer on it. I did tell Ryan that once this posts, uh, I would send him the Meatgistics link and he will keep an eye out and try to answer any questions people have. So if there was something you don't feel like was covered correctly, uh, please send or put your question underneath the Meatgistics podcast post uh, and he'll get a look at it. He also sent me some information um, and we'll be doing some more in further, further in depth uh, posts on that just to put it to bed once and for all. All right. We have 30,000 users on Meatgistics. Sweet. Yeah. 30,000 registered users. Really should have closer to like 35 or 40, but I. But you killed them. I handcuffed you for so, a while. So I did. He, the Austin assassinated them. Austin gave me the, the goal at the beginning of 2023 of increasing uh, Meatgistics uh, membership by, I think he said 10% or something like that. We were at 21,000 at that point. He then chopped off 4,000, so we went all the way back to 17,000. So I took us from 17,000 to 30,000. All me, all my decisions, I was the reason it, it no, it really was a uh, little bit of inside baseball. Austin and I argued for a good amount of time on whether or not we should do that, forcing people to log in uh, to even read the, the comments or to even read the threads. And I was on the don't do it side. It's also, we're not, I don't know. We're not as bad as some people out there. What I, what I think at least out there, if, there's ways around it. I just refresh the page and keep well, reading. But, but like some places like you can't view or do anything period. And so we wanted to come up with something, but it's, it, I mean, it helps our membership overall to not get only is, people engaged. Not only does it help membership, but I would, I have good numbers that show that it also increased engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so I want credit for it, um, but it was really your your decision that that drove that. I think there'll be a there there'll be other things we can do this year. I like your other idea about. Um, it, it kind of the reverse of what we've done in the past. Like when we first started Meatgistics, we have like a spot to like get, try to get people to post for the first time, mm -hmm. tell about themselves. Not many people do that. Mm -hmm. Like not many people do that anymore. Um, it was a bigger deal when things were smaller, but not, not anymore. But we do the reverse of it and we make a post that welcomes the new, welcomes new users instead of the, trying to get them to make a post. Well, it's not new users. New users well, I can always do. First time posters. First time posters. Yeah. And I already have it working. Oh, sweet. Um, I worked with no BB. So I made a post in roll call that uh, has first post for these new members. And then I list everybody out who made their first post in the last seven days. It's a good list. It's about 20 users. Um, and I wanted to call out one specifically. It's Daniel S. He's been a member since 2020 and just made his first post the other day. <laughs> then we have somebody else like uh, Val, Val Va or Vales KM who made their first post and already has like seven posts. His reputation is like 10. Um, so obviously good engagement there. Uh, so thank you to everybody who's who's joining in um, and, and contributing. I understand that tons of people like to lurk and that's totally valid too. If you don't have anything to say, why, you know, why join the conversation? But uh, you're more than welcome to. It's a fun community. Cool. Uh, and then 42,000 users on uh, YouTube. Hmm, that nice. has grown significantly over the last few months. Our number one video over the past 30 days is how to make snack sticks. Is that my version? That's not your version. Ah. That is my version that now has uh, 50,000 views and 572 likes, which for us is like a million. For sure. Dude. That has got to be the most liked video on our page i don't understand why people don't hit the like button i do but i don't <laughs> i don't know how I, often do you i used to never hit the like button <laughs> you're stingy with those likes. i was because part of it though too was youtube like 
they like curate a list and then there's like a liked video section and I, I use YouTube music and then it was like commingling things and it was it just putting things in a spot where I didn't like. So I, t I went through my history and I unliked everything. Mm -hmm. I went that far. But then I got to the point where I follow some other like small YouTube creators creators sure. yeah and i was like this is stupid i'm just every time i watch one of their videos i'm hitting the like button so i just said screw it we're going for it and now i just kind of got over my ocd with the whole thing and so i i like i like every video that is actually meaningful pertinent yeah to to what you like yeah um i had to really work to get my instagram feed back to normal it was showing me all sorts of crazy stuff and i actually had to go back through and i found this person I thought I was following for like, cause I align politically with them, but it turns out they're into some stuff that I'm not into. <laughs> so Instagram was like, oh, they like this, give them more of this. And I would talk about it in that room. I'd be like, why am I, this is like, I'm getting so much of this. Didn't make any sense. But uh, yeah, so that unfollowing a few people kind of fixed that. Um, all right, so for featured flavors today, I have two things. I'm dying, I'm, I skipped lunch today cause I was like, it's podcast oh, day. No. Okay. They're both hot. That's fine. Okay. So we have the gigawatt with the ghost pepper cheese. Uh, and we've specifically sat those out for an hour after they were uh, done smoking. Uh, I had another version, the same one that I left out for four hours. So just to see if there's any difference. There was a little bit. Um, the big difference between the two was that the ones that sat out for four hours were maintained slightly better of a snap after vacuum packing and freezing them. Uh, not night and day. Your father sold it to me like, oh, yeah, they'll be just like when you take them out of the smoker if you leave them out for like four hours. They were not. It it ultimately still depends what your water activity is because just looking at the package, there's well, there's liquid in there. Look at those. and yeah. These, not really. All right, so ghost pepper um, with gigawatt. And this is the ghost pepper that we're not getting. This is like one of the first ones we tried that ended up not being hot enough. Test batch. Yeah. Uh, ghost pepper cheese, five pound bags are back in stock. Um, and then we'll have one pound bags in probably the next couple of weeks. Uh, we had to wait for our second order of that to arrive. The first order was all five pound bags. Like it was already all back ordered. And what was left over was not enough to make one pound bags out of. Um, so in a couple of weeks, we should have ghost pepper back, which is good news. We're all very happy about that. It's been an annoyance. How often do you test shelf stability on the stuff you make? This never. I don't know. I don't treat it as if like those get frozen <clears throat> or put in the fridge. I'm just curious because I keep I know I've talked about in the podcast before, but I'm continuing my like. For whatever reason, you, you're not going like this, but buying snack sticks in the store. Um, I just I'm out places and instead of like normally I would get like chips or like, I don't know. Just whatever snack food. Yeah. I'm making like a concerted effort. Like when I want snacks, I'm like, no, you're eating protein. Good. So that's good. Uh, just when I'm out, I, mean, I buy snack sticks then. I'd buy jerky, but jerky gets stuck in my teeth. And so I'm just continuing my snack stick crusade. And so I'm wor I'm working through just more and more different options. And it's, it's interesting <sighs> to just like compare like textures, yeah. compare, uh, fla I mean, flavors, but uh, texture and like dryness level. Some of them get really dry. Yeah. Like I'm like, why would you, why, why would you go for shelf dry. stability off of things being dry, which kind of brings up the conversation with, with the, the ball cam guy. Um, he said he's he, on he, do not disturb. It was my voice assistant. It mm -hmm. thought it was, it was, okay. yeah, I know. Um, but the, the ball cam guy, is that how you say it? Ball cam? Ball cam. Ball cam. He said, Balcom. One, two, three. um, some, something about when you guys are talking about shelf stability, like, yeah, when you're looking at a dry or semi-dry, it's nicer to have a semi-dry to have a little bit of moisture in it because right. you can drop pH to get to shelf stability. So um, just out of my own curiosity, I might have to uh, go through and do some testing on some of the stuff you've made to see what 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 really is shelf stable. Is some of the other stuff that I eat at different times, is it just really dry or is, are, do they really have to be that point? Is that what they're going for, that dryness, or is it truly like a shelf stability type of thing and john is quickly leaving question. the room bummed him he said you know what see you later we're gonna do a reel now where he's running doing something first person pov and he's coming 
I got the ticket. It really does look like an empty pen. All right. Almost. All right. So while we're chatting here. Wait, is this pH meter? Yeah. All right. We'll do the first section of this and we will take the pH of this. So it's going to take just a few. So we'll see if it's even worth. Do you know how much ECA you put in this? Yeah. Yeah, you, I always use four ounces. You always do four ounces. Always four ounces. Yeah. In theory, I'm going to say it should be should be just about 4.9. Maybe if you're lucky, 4.8, but somewhere in that realm. Lucky? What do you mean lucky? I don't get lucky. Well, in uh, my opinion, lucky. I like things more lower, lower pH, more tang, more sour. This one always annoys me because it jumps around so much to begin with. Then it eventually uh, stabilizes. So we'll test these. We'll test those. Um, I didn't think the gigawatts had much taste to them, to be honest. Mm. If you don't get like that heat from it, there's not much flavor behind the gigawatt. I think that's kind of the purpose is it's it's not like it's not supposed to be the most flavorful thing in the world. It's supposed to be hot. Yeah, but it's hard to have flavor with hot. Did you feel like that was very hot? I mean, it had a little bit of spice to it, but it was For not. a standard packaged snack stick? Yeah. It's pretty hot. Mm, okay. But could it be hotter? Yeah. It's just when you're talking packaged seasonings, you're trying to please the masses. So it's not going to be the world's spiciest thing ever. Yeah. These are not going to be shelf stable. It's going to stop at like 5-1. Which you might be able to, depending on how low the water activity is, because these are fairly dry for homemade snack sticks. The little ones, not the big ones. The big ones are are fairly juicy. I can only imagine how fascinating this is on a podcast to sit here and listen to oh, me. The best. Austin's about to finish his, oh, his nope, chew. Drop, drop down he's been working on for a little nine. bit. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, just drop down. If you didn't down. chew, we wouldn't have anything. So. <laughs> we don't even know. Because it went down to four. We really do need like inline clickers to like. Yeah, I know. Turn the mics on. Yeah, and we turn off. Do that. Patrick, can you look up, look up somewhere like that something we can put in between this that like a mute button up yeah, there yeah, for us? Yeah, you point at me and I'll go. No, no, no. I want to control it myself. It's a yeah. It's a thing's called a cough button. I'll check yeah. it out. I can't wait until we we get that we put it in and then we record a whole episode with, with, with one of us anybody. on mute. <laughs> It'll <laughs> it, definitely it will happen. happen. It will happen. Definitely happen. the cough episode. It's <clears throat> going all over the place. Um, okay, so while we're doing that, also, guys, we have a, a, a new social media guy coming in. Um, we have not had one since about August. Uh, I extended an offer to a gentleman this morning. He accepted, so you guys will meet uh, Chase, hopefully here pretty soon. We'll have him interacting with you guys on social media, on uh, on Meetgistics, uh, and just all around a really good guy. Um, excited to welcome him aboard. Uh, he'll be starting a little bit later in April. Um, I'm about to give up on this because it's just now reading nonsense scores. And it's going between 4-1 and 5-7. Hmm. So it might need recalibration. Yeah. I'm going to say something's wrong. Yeah. Do you know how to use it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just make sure. I've been using this for all the dry cured stuff, but I haven't calibrated it in the mm. last couple of months. That scares me now. To go back and think that, can I, is, is John going to kill me because he's not accurately reading raw sausage? I mean, <laughs> yes, John's going to kill you at some point. <laughs> what what it is, we don't know. Okay, I'm giving up on that. It, it, this needs calibration before I can use it again. Uh, the habanero barbecue, though, is a phenomenal snack stick. I absolutely love it. I also like it as a summer sausage, but I like it more as a snack stick. So it's got sugar, number one ingredient, salt. And then spices, including mustard seed, dehydrated habanero peppers, and powder blend, including dried chilies and spices, dehydrated garlic and onion, paprika, and then natural spice extratives. You would really say snack stick, though, over summer sausage. Yeah. I would always rather eat a snack stick than a summer sausage. I don't know. I don't know. To each their own there. If if I had if I had to choose snack stick or summer sausage, I would probably usually choose a snack stick. But on the habanero barbecue, I'd probably prefer that in the, in the summer sausage. 
It's a delicious summer sausage. The only one I like even close to as much as tons. Um, but yeah, no, I'd still rather have it as a snack stick. It's just so good, especially with the cheddar cheese. Interesting. Really, really Packing good. away mental notes for later. I don't feel like any of that is stuff that you need to take notes on. Just thanks to Harbor against John for the future. <laughs> All right, moving on to um, uh, idioms. Now, I have a, a different way I want to play this time. So idioms is where we take a <clears throat> saying that, uh, you know, an idiom that's based on food, and we discover what the actual origin of it. But we're going to do it differently this time. I have three options, and you guys are going to guess which one is the correct one. All right, so the idiom is bringing home the bacon. So I have three different options for it. One is a priest back in the 1500s was so impressed with the love of this couple that he actually awarded them with a a side of bacon. Another one is a boxing match uh, where one of the boxers telegraphed home to his mom, or she telegraphed to him before the fight and said, the world is watching, bring home the bacon. Like, yeah, you got a fight to do, but still bring bacon when you come back. And the third one um, is based from uh, company towns and company stores. Um, They would bring home the bacon from the company store. Do you not know about company stores? No. Patrick? Company stores. I sold my soul to the company store. Okay, so a company store was um, back in like the early 1800s in America. There would be towns that would build all up around like one factory or one company, and they would try to like use their own tent, like legal tender to pay their employees. And then they Uh. forced them to, which could only really be used at the company store. So it was just a different form of indentured servitude. That's what they do in America. We have U.S. dollars and then. Oh, yeah. oh, well. But just, you can use the U.S. dollar pretty much worldwide. It's bigger. Yeah, yeah but then the world's not. I mean, then what? We only bound to Earth? Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. What are you guessing? I, Whoop. Who did it? That's me. Oh. 50 lashes with a wet noodle for John. Okay. Why is he calling me at this time of the day? That's weird. So I want to know. How long did it take for you to come up with these three ideas? Not long at all. I'm very creative. I also want to know ah. what goes on inside ah. your brain. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Because <laughs> those are just th- three very weird. It's a very random place up there. Yeah. Um, if there was a drawing of the inside of your brain, and it was like a cartoon sketch. Mostly just darkness. Just I want darkness. darkness. I want it to be the boxing match one. That's okay. what I'm going with. Patrick, what's that? What's no. the question? Don't worry about it. <laughs> you weren't listening. <laughs> um, it is the boxing match one. Sweet. Now, there is some argument for the first one, um, but it did not start being used anywhere near the 1500s. It was really in the early uh, 21st century. So, so there Fun. you go. Well done. Austin is, is one for one there. All right, moving on to... Meat Matters, uh, McDonald's 10-Year Quest for Sustainable Beef. It's not really worth reading the whole article. I didn't <laughs> oh, I didn't even put notes on it. I just wanted, wanted to talk about it. Skimmed it. Um, it did make it seem like McDonald's has actually gone to, to some pretty great lengths to at least be able to market their beef as sustainable beef. Um, I thought that was interesting because this is the same company that we talked about on a live stream recently or maybe last podcast legitimately tried to trademark the term 100 percent natural beef so that they could use whatever they wanted and just say no this is our 100 percent natural beef like that is dang really rewriting the rules smart i mean yeah. <laughs> let's be honest that that would be genius if they could have pulled it off thankfully they were not allowed to um but interesting that the industry is kind of going this way I see more stuff, more and more stuff on regenerative farming. It seems like every month now I'm reading some article on how they, another medium to somewhat larger size. Yeah, my boss won't stop talking about it. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the medium to larger size uh, farm is going to the regenerative farming model, uh, which again, just focuses on uh, kind of soil health by moving different animals in and out of different pastures. Um, not using the same types of fertilizer. Um, so yeah, just, I found that interesting. All right. Uh, beef outlook. 
are record high prices on the horizon. This is from ruralradio.com. America's families might soon see record high beef <clears throat> prices at the grocery store thanks to the lowest cattle inventory in more than 70 years. The American Farm Bureau Federation economist analyzed the USDA inventory report uh, in the latest market intel. There were 87.2 million cattle and calves in the United States as of January 2nd, 2024. 2% lower than the exact same time in 2023. It's the lowest inventory since 1951. Just four years ago, there were 95 million cattle in the U.S. It's crazy. That is absolutely insane. And we are in for it, I think, coming up. Now, here's compounding that issue is U.S. beef export outlook for 2024 shows promise. Why are we exporting beef if we're looking at record high prices within the United States. It, it does. Well, it, it, it depends on if demand actually falls at the same rate that supply is and prices are increasing and it's probably not going to be equal. Rarely will you have like the supply and demand just perfectly aligned. Right. Something's going to have to give and take. So in theory, if the supply is going down and prices are going up, it's going to drop demand. Well, what if demand drops beyond where supply actually is? So then in the U.S., we we consume even less than the supply dropped. So people still have supply. They then export. So it's possible. It makes sense. But in theory, it should help keep prices from drop or, or keep prices from going as high, if that makes sense. Then. No. Why would it keep prices from going as high? Because if demand drops far enough, if prices go up, okay, but then demand drops, and then it just it it's gonna it means prices are gonna go are up gonna go and up. down and up yeah. and down. They're gonna okay. roll a coaster. So they go up so high that nobody can afford it. Everybody stops drinking it or eating it, and then it starts coming down again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, tell the more. I wanted to stop it from going up. Period. Keep the beef here. That would require a, a communist government sitting oh, and controlling wouldn't. prices. Just say that this is, <laughs> this food is a national security item. You're not exporting it. Oh, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, in theory, send it. Probably not a good to Kansas. Idea, um, the, more, the reason the more we meddle, the worse off we're probably. That's actually be. true. Uh, the reason that um, the exports are looking like they're going to be good is increased demand from Japan and uh, another country. Can't remember what. And they're saying it's because tourism is starting to pick back up more. So Good there's tourism. still a huge tourism lull from all the COVID stuff. I would say is Japan like the opposite of us? Like they, we, we look at Japan and go, oh, they have really good beef. In Japan, do they go, oh, the U.S. has really good beef? No, <laughs> probably not. But you're not making, um, you know, street food out of Kobe beef, right? Like you want just a regular it would be insane. Like, remember we talked about the 42-year waiting list for those dumplings? Yeah, those COVID, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they need something else to be able to um, serve just regularly. True. To the regular people. The poors, if you will. Huh. Uh, tough quarter one beef sales for Tyson Foods. It says, operating income for the protein to hides processor was $231 million, which was down 51% from the same period a year early. Now, I don't know, but operating income does not sound like profit. It's can you play with that number? It, yeah, you can play with anything. Yeah, how it's, would you? It's not it, the, the the better way to look at it would probably be revenue. What was revenue? Because yes, prices go up and down, so revenue can change even with the quantity at the same amount. Okay, but operating income is going to fluctuate a lot more because yes, it, did did they have any any large charges or write-offs um, that would come yeah that would okay okay it, i didn't it, know if it would come out of operating income um but adjusted operating income was 411 million dollars <laughs> down nine percent uh total company adjusted operating margin was 3.1 percent non non-gap non okay. too which that basically signifies to me anyways don't trust this number huh. so um, I thought he was going to talk more, so I took a big bite. My bad. So I, I, it, it's yeah, it's interesting. Um, if if things really go and change that far, you would you would tend to think that there's something else going on. Um, if revenue did not 
changed by much. Um, did it talk revenue in here at all? I'm looking through and I don't see anything. Actual on it. revenue? No, I didn't see yeah. anything with that. But either way, I would I, I, I would say that um, from what I've been hearing and reading elsewise, like I would expect to continue to see beef sales suffer. So it makes sense what we're seeing there. It says our team executed well in the quarter and delivered tangible results, including our third sequential quarter of adjusted operating income growth. We saw the benefits of our diverse protein portfolio and realization of operational efficiencies from the strategic decisions we made the past year. So yay, good for Tyson. Uh, McDonald's chicken sales soar to match beef. McDonald's makes as much money from chicken products such as sandwiches and nuggets as they do from beef burgers. I can't believe that. Executives from the burger giant credit this partly to the excess of the McCrispy line at McDonald's earnings call on Monday. Our chicken category now represents $25 billion in annual system-wide sales on par with beef, said CEO Chris Kaczynski. John, how many times? What's how, how many times did I ask you to watch Super Size Me 2? <laughs> He's bringing They it back literally up. tell you why chicken is just doing this and beef is going down, but, you know, whatever. I will say if I go to McDonald's, which isn't often, but when I do, I'm getting a McCrispy. Yeah, I'm going to stop after work. What's a McCrispy? Another double quarter pounder and cheese. You guys, you guys, because <laughs> you said that. You guys after. mean a McChicken? What's the McCrispy? Is that like yeah, their, their elevated chicken sandwich? So you have to call yeah. it McCrispy? Okay, yeah. I, I've had it. It's fine. It, uh, I like the chicken sandwiches almost anywhere. Like they kind of have to mess up and have like a big piece of gristle is probably the wrong word. But you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Bite it and you go, oh, well, it takes you out of it almost. But other than that, there, BK has a good one. I always thought BK's was the best. Yeah. I liked the like the almost sub format of it. Um, like the the flavor. Oh, that, the original one, yeah. Oh, That's, is that not what they do anymore? No, nah, everyone's conformed to like the the Popeye style, like their version of that. I think they have that. Sometimes I've heard people complain that they take them on and off the menu all the time because people get so it's like, like the McRib. Yeah, it was like the two for five or seven, then it got more expensive. But then if you ever really have it, you go, oh, this isn't very this isn't very good unless the they, long one? unless they crush it. Oh no, yeah. So okay, but. I, I was also different. in high school probably yeah, the last time I yeah, had one. It's the so. greatest thing ever. Remember, we talked about it, McSorley's, yeah, like yeah. McDonald's, like a uh, higher class. They're they're trying these the restaurants menu, in yeah. a few different places. I think it's called McSorley's. And apparently it's a huge success. Like yeah. everywhere they have them, they're doing awesome. So I did something cool. Uh, speaking of Burger King, where they have. They prompt you to you get to add any three toppings to a, a Whopper. Okay. You get to choose your base of either a regular Whopper or an Impossible Whopper. So that's an easy decision. Regular Whopper, Impossible is not meat. And then you you with the help of AI, you type in three different ingredients. So I didn't know what to do. Uh, winner gets a million dollars. So I kind of phoned it in and went like pepperoni, mozzarella cheese, and marinara sauce. So I was like, I would eat something like that because oftentimes it is like a chicken parm on the menu instead of like a burger. I was like, that's that's a cool enough different take on it. What are your instant three toppings you're going to put on a Whopper to win a million dollars? Cheese of three different kinds. Oh, you're just going three different cheese? Probably. Oh man, he lost money. I, I like yours. Yours yeah. was good. <laughs> oh, and it could be off the wall stuff too. Like this, they had an AI image creator to help you. All right. Well, let me think about it sure, for a while. Yeah. You can't just throw me on the spot like that. <laughs> I would, I'm creative, but not like that. <laughs> I, I would do. This is getting. This is gonna get weird. But if we're trying to be unique and win a million dollars, I'm gonna say I want my burger with some pulled pork. There you go. And some barbecue sauce and like a, a gooey cheese, maybe Havarti or something. Ah, there you go. That's what the If the, if the barbecue sauce right didn't count, I feel like you maybe could add like a crispy onion or something on there and help set it off a little bit. Oh, but. crispy onion straws. That'd be cool. <gasps> Any burger that has crispy onion straws or crispy onion rings, anything mm -hmm. with used ah, in. That's, yeah. 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 That's what I had. Isn't that what I had? I think that's what I had. I don't remember now. We went yeah. out with Rob. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It was. I got a Durango burger. That All was right, the one with the onion rings on Did it. Did we talk about yeah. this last time? I still don't think I'm weird for what I did. You getting your burger? No. Eating everyone else's food? Yeah. Wait, we oh, no, we that? haven't. You went to the restaurant now. Okay. This is the podcast. So. Hold on. I don't have an issue with it. I don't care. So, yeah, so we're sitting there. We're, uh, Ron Cher is who we do a lot of our TV advertising with the company. Um, our <laughs> account manager came down. Uh, he's above an account manager. I don't. He's handling our they're, account now. They're like VP of sales. Yeah, or VP like of that. sales. Um, he's managing our account right now. Um, Rob Burrell. Um, great guy. So I get a like a Baja, it was a Baja? I'm pretty sure it was Baja shrimp yeah. pasta. Yeah. Delicious. Absolutely delicious. And I'm, eat it. I'm 
full, no problem. He gets some sea bass thing or something, and they put like some shrimp in there. And so I look over and I see he's got shrimp, and he's like, "I'm like, are you gonna eat those?" He's like, "Nah, I'm full." And I, you know, well, they put. <laughs> so I'm just he's he traveled down here for us. He's going back to a hotel, so I'm assuming he's getting a to go for those shrimp because they were big and they looked delicious. So the the waitress comes and grabs his plate, and she's like, "Would you like a?" A box for those and he goes no that's fine i go no 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 and grabbed the plate took it and ate all the shrimp <laughs> off that plate is just, that weird no, oh, no okay you made it sound like it was like everyone's oh yeah no no no. just the one person. <laughs> just this i didn't then go <laughs> no i do that all the time yeah okay with, I, a, with a kid oh you're not gonna eat that buddy so <laughs> I, I, yeah i think it depends upon like what situation you're used to like it, I, it made it, you seem uh, poor now that i think about it to be honest, it, it it probably depends. Yeah, did you grow up poor or did you grow up with lots of money? Like, because when I was a kid, like, my parents didn't have much. Right. And, like, what food there was, if it was good, it was yeah, it was a, a fend for yourself. And sure. you better eat what's on your plate and yep. then be the first one to get seconds if you want more because there's only so That's much and it's not going to go First one to get around. seconds. People don't talk about that. So, so my family of three now, they go, why you eat so fast? I go, I was, I was the youngest of six. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you just eat your, it, a, a food scarcity mentality. And so, but that, that would be my guess. So that works and it doesn't work. I grew up middle class, like very middle class. Um, never, you know, we didn't have a ton of money, but it was never like, oh no, there's not enough food in the house. Right. Well, maybe not like there's not enough food in the house, but was there, did you have an overindulgence? Did you get whatever you wanted whenever you wanted? Like food wise? Yeah. No. So there was at least some food scarcity. It, but no, because I could have gone and eaten something else. It's just he's playing within the rules. I'm just yeah. trying to figure out why it is that I eat as fast as I do. And the best <laughs> I can explain it is when I like something, not having the food actively like eating causes a panic reaction in my mind. Mm. It's like, no, get that. So <laughs> get oh, yeah. get, it's, oh it's like a dog when it gets steak they go oh my god and they turn into a different animal so every Kinda. food to you is steak yeah, I mean I don't you do eat it. steak a lot so but anyways that nice little peek in this, into my brain all right uh, the poultry industry in the United States this is from uh, uh, Statistica and it's uh, just that Tyson both their turkey and their chicken combined is worth forty three billion. McDonald's what? is over half in just chicken of what Tyson does in both chicken and turkey. That kind of puts that a little bit more into a uh, line of, of how amazing it is that McDonald's is selling $25 billion a year of chicken. You're also talking like... Worldwide. Well, no. You're, all, uh, you're, you're, also, you're also talking two different like... Um, yep. Yeah, I get you. One's going <laughs> to way said. charge up for it. Yeah, you're, right. wholesale versus retail yeah, pricing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that makes sense. It's still impressive. Doesn't matter. Uh, Iowa pig farmers face worse loss in 25 years. Cost high, demand low. Uh, beef and pork, pork industry are down. Last year, they averaged a loss of $32, or do, ugh, geez, $32 a hog. And this year, they're expected to lose $18 a hog. That'd be the worst 18, geez, I can't talk. That'd be the worst two-year stretch since 1998 to 1999, which is fine because that's only a couple of years ago. Oh, no, that's 25 years ago. That's a quarter century. They're going to have the worst two-year stretch in a quarter century. My thought is send, the best seeker, the send those. Of leave my beef here. Send the hogs to the other countries if they want meat. This is our beef. Can't have it. That's what Arby's stands for. Exactly. That's what Ar I was thinking about Arby. when I said it. <laughs> uh, Beijing butchers glum bunch as Lunar New Year meat sales are slow. So last year during this time, it's uh, the spring festival. The butchers or hog sellers would expect to sell 20 hogs a day. This year, they're selling five. Again. That's crazy. I think there's something, there's more going on in China than we're aware of. Like either their population was decimated by covid and they don't have the number of people they used to have or something is happening because there's too many stories about how nobody's buying this nobody's buying that even though that they're cutting production of it they still have like a there's too many stories so something's going on they're lying somehow okay uh moving on to wild card we've got a a little bit different this time 
Um, I went, got into a really good, th- uh, I don't know, the algorithm was sending me awesome animal videos for a while. So I sent a few of them to Walton's and we're going to look at those and we'll put them on the YouTube content for this as well. But first, um, just FYI, for everyone to know, especially those of you on the coasts, fatal shark attacks doubled in 2023. Double. So there are twice as many as usual. So people aren't as strong as they used to be. Like, there's that. <laughs> well, I, I want to know now because I'm pretty sure conspiracy theorist John in the past has has said that they're just not reported. So are the attacks actually going up or because you are forefront and centered at, at making sure this issue is known out there? <laughs> <It's, laughs> if I ever go to Australia, the government's going to... Just disappear me. They're going, it's him. Are the reports just actually coming through? And He's making, of- no, because none of, they're all like, I, I think what's happening is. You find what you look for? More. <laughs> well, no, I didn't, you know, this this has nothing to do with me, that, that twice as many people were reported dying. Sure. Um, I think what's happening is, A, you've got way more people at the beaches with cameras everywhere. You also have surf cams, which are recording things 24 hours a day. So people who had just disappeared before, now they're like, oh, no, like we have video evidence of a shark getting them, right? So I think I think that's part of it. Um, the it's other also, part is I, I honestly, I, I think we've protected sharks, specifically great whites, for long enough now where more mature of male, female sharks are at a size where they're going to start trying to prey upon people. I mean, back in... <laughs> The late 80s, early 90s, there there was real concern that the great white shark was going to go extinct from overfishing. So we stopped uh, any fishing for them, and we protected their main food source, uh, seals and sea lions. Uh, so the population of them has exploded. So there's way more large, dangerous sharks coming into contact with your average swimmer. Did we eat shark yet? Yes. Okay. I don't remember. We deep fried it. I don't remember all the food. Remember, I put it in... Uh, it was actually pretty chicken good. Yeah, it was really good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've got to do uh, Deer Creek Jones, drones, uh, the guy who comes here and does the... Yeah. Um, he gave us some uh, billfish, uh, paddlefish. We've got to do a will of barbecue with that. I keep forgetting. We have to do <gasps> it. But that's... Brought the rabbit in. I you? saw that. Okay. I saw that. Okay. So there's, we have some rabbit meat we'll also... Which is going to be our first like good will of barbecue in a while. I'll see what I can do. I'm mostly there excited might be to see what I can do with it. I'm mostly just excited to see like what does it really taste like? Yeah. It can't be bad, but is it like just chicken? I also pork? I also it's have totally liver different. in there though, so I could do like a rabbit liver or something. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> how about uh Let's cook the, some of it normal. How about the beef cheek that I bought? You bought beef cheek? Dude, I too? went to Sam's uh to get that rib roll and I looked down and there's just this big package of just like hunks of meat i was like what is that cheek meat and it sure was i snatched it up uh they apparently don't normally get it they order it in for one person and she only needed two cases this time instead of three so they had like the rest of it out there mm. interesting all right PETA wants wichita's <laughs> chance rides to stop using animal figures on amusement rides PETA is protesting a wichita company because they make carousels you know, the carousels where little kids yeah. sit on yeah. a horse, fake horse or whatever, and it goes up and down and round and round. I'm more surprised there's a carousel company in town. I'm right? more surprised <laughs> that there's any PETA people in this town. <laughs> so someone saw that and said, oh, my God, I got a call. I can't do this. They, they took a picture, called, hey, hey, you're the, you're the PETA guy? Get a load of this. Yeah, no. <laughs> what are they doing? Uh, making shapes of animals. N- oh. Next, they're going to go ahead and... Uh, protest against artists who draw landscapes with animals. Wait till they them. find out they have a Halloween themed one that's actually made out of animal skin and then they sew it together <laughs> for the actual cows. That's going to be wild. That'll blow their mind. Yeah. What, what is he saying? I'm saying PETA, yeah. who's mad right. at faux carousel right. stuff. I'm saying in Halloween times, you know, this Halloween, when they right. have a carousel that's made out of animal skin, that's oh, really so you're joking. Good. Yeah. Okay. That would be like that would be ridiculous. <laughs> you didn't think I was but joking awesome. the first time. No, I didn't get it. Everyone, uh, chat. Uh, w's up if uh, you thought I was joking the first time. All right. Go ahead. What were you gonna say? Oh, I just I I don't understand why like that's the big issue is just a like uh, a image of an animal versus like there's so many other things that you could you could go for that you might actually get 
some sort of public support on. But yeah. this is, it's almost, it's laughable. Zero sane people will support this. One out of three things I think causes something like that. Your life is way <clears throat> too easy um, and you're looking for things to have problems with. <laughs> your life is so disorganized that you have to find something else to focus your anger on instead of trying to figure out your own life. Or three, there are people who just have a ridiculous understanding of what animals are. Moving into this next story, um, Florida man arrested for having and letting two Kodiak bear cubs escape down in Florida. It's the middle of the night. This guy's driving down a road in Florida near, uh, I think it was Panama City? No. Panama City. Panama too. City. Okay. Um, and sees two Kodiak bear cubs on the side of the road. First of all, Kudos to that guy for getting out. Because even a, if you look at it, those bear cubs come up to like here on him. And you're not telling me that that couldn't do damage. How fast? Like I'm driving. Yeah. Man, were those bear cubs? Was that, was that a, I'm not was that a grizzly the car, bear? Dude, I'm going wild. Well, wild. It, right. Because no one's going to believe The mother me. might be around. I'm going to take a picture. He got no. out of the car and petting them. No. Dude. So this guy imported two Kodiak bears. Kodiak bear is the biggest of all bears. It, it says that in the article. I thought the polar bear was technically bigger. But they, like, they're only really Kodiak bears if they're from a certain island. Okay. And they have such amazing food sources, elk, salmon, all that stuff, that they grow enormous. And this guy had them in a cage that was nothing but some wired fence with chicken wire over the top to prevent them <laughs> from crawling out. He claims they forgot he forgot to latch the, the gate, but I'm sure they just went... No, I might be a baby, but I'm still a bear. I'm going to just push this right open. Man. Says he was also issued warnings for improper enclosures for other animals, including foxes, skunks, and raccoons. Yeah, those three. Why are, why are you collecting skunks? Like, so is that a thing? Yeah, that kind of is now. Like, people are having what? pet skunks. Why? That's so Well, dumb. hold on. They remove the. They remove the. And they are kind of adorable. <laughs> Have you ever seen a baby skunk? I'll never forget the time I was coming back from golf <laughs> once. I looked up the road and I'm like, is that. Like a bunch of trash bags going across me. Like, but it was a family of skunks, and most of them were like this big. And they were just, I mean, my, they were adorable. My favorite thing, like everyone born before 19, like 87 is like, could be a famous TikToker with a story that they say. There's like, oh, no, no, no. One time when I was this, and it's like, oh, oh like I if just, you had a. Yeah, exactly. You know, that would that, like, and I'm not discrediting it. It's just like, man, sure. that would be actually a cool video that I'd like to see, but technology wasn't there. Yeah. When things have. Just used to happen. Oh, dude, today I pulled out it. my phone today twice, and I never do that. Besides the time I filmed that lady getting kicked out of a wedding, but then yeah, that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> he on the way, on me. the way here today, I saw just like an Apache-looking helicopter thing. You know, the one where there's like two pro sets of propellers, one on the front end and one on the back end. Oh, it was like all black. It was just ripping right. across the sky. Chinook. Not making a single sound. I go, oh my God, where's my phone? I was like, oh, dude, check that out. You know, just kind of really impressed with my camera skills, but let's be honest. And then today, out of my car around lunchtime, I was just like, I look up and I go, oh, dude, there's there's two birds trying to fend off a hawk from something and they're like in air fighting. And I go, oh, let me pull up my phone for that. And then as I'm doing it, I feel like I sound like the rainbow guy. I'm like, oh, a, thir a third bird. <laughs> I go three birds, one hawk. <gasps> oh, my God. And I'm like, evasive maneuver 12. And then you can't see him. But yeah, today of all days, I pull up my phone twice and we're talking about it. All right. The four videos I have. It, it, what is Sikorsky? Sikorsky is also. Crystal. Yeah, no, no. It's also. It sounds a, Russian. Yeah. You know what that is? That's the one that has like no <laughs> belly. It's the open belly. Oh. And it like carries. Yeah. Things. Yeah. Okay, so of the four Instagram stories I sent, this is the one we'll watch first. Um, I will describe it, but also, or Patrick will also put these videos up on the YouTube. So it's a bunch of people uh, scuba diving. Bad idea just to begin with. And <laughs> they're good distance down. There's about eight of them. They're annoying a shark, which is smart. Shark gets one guy. Goes around, starts freaking out, comes back, gets that guy again. Then he's going to swim away, but nope, turns his, changes his mind, tries to bite a guy in the face, starts swimming away again, and then goes, nope, I actually think I'm going to eat this guy and attempts to eat a person. Everybody freaks out and swims away. Moral of the story. That's insane. Stay out of the ocean. That's scary in there. Black Panther found in Missouri. 
So this guy's driving around Missouri, and he had said he had seen a Black Panther in a field, grabbed it, tur- grabbed his camera, turned around, and as you can see, I mean, that looks as bigger than a house cat for sure. <laughs> it looks like there is a Black Panther in Missouri. That is kind of interesting. You you hear about that occasionally, that they're in the Ozarks, but you never really know, you know, what to believe. We We used to have people who swore that there were wolves in the Adirondacks. And maybe there are, but I never saw any evidence of it. Uh, going on, this next one, don't worry so much about the clawed animal at the beginning. Um, that is just a, a sloth that they're spraying with something for some reason. That one, that's the creepy one. So this guy is picking up something that just looks like some broken down plastic. But no, it's about a 40 foot long Shedded snakeskin. No. Yeah. And then look at that. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I forget you're terrified of snakes. Uh, <laughs> so then this next one is this huge anaconda <laughs> yeah. crawling into a, I'm, a, a I'm pipe. Not even you don't have to look. Yeah. Uh, crawling into a uh, drainage pipe. And it is, I mean, it's got to be two feet, three feet in uh, circumference. And then this last one is the one that everyone's, you don't want to see it. It's snake one also. Um, this is also the one that every time I see it, I try to like save it or because I can never find it when I'm looking for it. They're down in some jungle and this guy's got some sort of uh, heavy equipment, like construction equipment. And it's big. I mean, I would guess that that thing is 15 feet in the air at least. Yeah. And in the across the bucket, the snake is across the bucket, and it is all the way down on both sides. And it's not fake because you can see the snake coming back up its own body on one side. That has got to be minimum of a 30-foot snake. Yeah. That's nuts. <sighs> and he's lifting it even higher. So also, let's add jungles to the oceans. Those two things just don't go in. Oh, yeah. You don't. No. Stay out. I'd say jungle is worse than the ocean. You would rather be lost in, would you rather be lost in the middle of the jungle or the middle of the ocean? Do I have a raft? Well, it depends. Yes, you have a raft. I'd probably take the ocean. Oh my, are you kidding me? You will die in the jungle. You will will die die in the middle of the the ocean. I I feel like. country is the jungle in? Yeah, but I feel like in in the ocean, I at least have a chance of like being seen, like uh, uh, a coast guard coming out with helicopters, find me, rescue me. In the jungle, you're screwed. I don't think you have a good understanding of how big the ocean is if you think they're just going to see you. Well, it depends on where you're at. Like, are we? He's like, just taking his chances with the ships instead of the the yeah. no plane. And then he he's very aware of like the big cats, the potential of like. Yeah, uh, I could walk my way out of a jungle. Maybe. Nah. What, what do you say? Mosquitoes might kill you. Like yeah, mosquitoes you spiders. Kill me. Do you know how many centuries? things are in the jungle that can kill you? Are you in the barefoot? O- in the ocean? In a raft? No. The only thing that's going to kill you is lack of food and water, and eventually or like a storm, weather, a yeah. shark. But like in the jungle, like you take one wrong sun step and you might step on something poisonous. Torched by the sun? No, I'm at least on my feet. I at least have a fighting chance. If I'm in a raft in the middle of the ocean, I'm 100% at the mercy of that. Well, if you set, are we setting up camp in the jungle anywhere? I guess nightly, but I'm saying you can poop in the ocean. There's a plus. (laughs) It'd be harder to poop off of a raft than it would be just in the jungle. You don't have to poop off of the raft, John. (laughs) It's weird. No. Sure you can. Granted, you either one would be terrible. What would really scare me wouldn't be the big cats in the jungle. It would be like some of the more venomous snakes. That would probably freak me out more than anything. But I, I could at least walk. Yeah. I uh, just new topic. Uh anxiety. <laughs> All right. Well, we don't have any more topics. That was the end of it. So uh remember. If you have questions for Ryan, post them on this post. Uh, We will get that to him and we'll see what he can answer. I also do have some documentation from him. Uh, I will be going through that, digesting it and making uh, just some comments on the uh, Meet Your Six post for this. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you later. Thanks for checking out the Meet Your Six podcast. To shop everything but the meat, head on over to Waltons.com. To get your meat processing questions answered by experts and enthusiasts alike, head on over to our online community at MeatGistics.com. Walton's, everything but the meat.